Oh boy, I just got done watching X-Men 97. You know I've been looking forward to this one. It premiered on Disney+. Plus. They have two episodes up. And I I've said this before, but X-Men was my favorite show as a kid. I know a lot of folks, Batman the Animated Series was like their favorite show that actually respected the audience, took it more seriously, you know, respected us as kids being able to figure things out. X-Men was my favorite. Batman was my second favorite. X-Men was my number one. But for some folks, it was backwards. Either way, this show was beloved. So when they were going to bring it back, I'm like, okay, great. It's going to be Disney. I'm not so sure about that because, you know, Disney has kind of not been great with Marvel stuff lately. But it's X-Men and it's got some of the original people that are involved or that were involved still doing it. So I want to talk about X-Men 97. First of all, from the very beginning, this is a love letter to the original show. The OG intro is there, except it's been redone with the modern animation style, and they changed the way certain characters are. Like, for example, Morph and Bishop are now in the opening intro. They're there, and um, they show some different scenes. And what's interesting is Episode 2 is even more different than Episode 1 because they showed more scenes, and uh, they had different X-Men there that weren't in Episode 1's intro. So that was cool. Uh, and so I want to say, first of all, the animation is not the same as it was in the 90s. It's very fluid, but it's not quite, it, it's kind of like Archer mixed with What If, right? Like, it's got that kind of style. Um, a little bit janky here and there, I won't lie. Some of it's a little bit janky, but if they were going to make it as close to the original as possible without actually hiring, like, a full-on animation team that animates the old style... This is the best thing they could have done. And it still looked great for the most part. It kind of looked very stylistic and if it, for the most part. Uh, I loved it. It was worth the wait. Okay. this I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to gush over this, yo. X-Men 97 was so much better than I was expecting. Completely blew away even my expectations. So the mutants, it, it picks up right after the original X-Men show. So if you haven't seen the original 92 X-Men you got to go back and watch all five seasons. Trust me, it'll be worth it because you'll understand the significance of some of these events a lot more. Mutants are still being persecuted. Um, the Friends of Humanity now have Sentinel technology, which is not good. Now, when it comes to the voice acting, most of it is great. Cyclops is played by a different actor. He sounds the same. Rogue, I don't like Rogue's new voice compared to her original voice. Beast and Jubilee sound exactly the same and Wolverine sounds exactly the same too so at least they got that right now I want to say the, the story here is that they find out that the Friends of Humanity have access to Sentinel technology and that there's more Sentinels coming this is basically sort of like a soft remake of the original first Night of the Sentinels episode except that instead of it being Jubilee who's being persecuted it's actually Roberto de Acosta who's being persecuted, a.k.a. Sunspot. So, it's cool to see Sunspot in this first episode. They end up saving him from the Friends of Humanity, and the whole thing is that the X-Men have to stay vigilant now because Xavier is gone, but there's still issues. So, uh, Wolverine's voice was so much better than the trailer. So, Cyclops questions Sunspot, and he doesn't know anything. So, Jubilee takes him to the Danger Zone, and that's where we first meet Wolverine. Um, basically what's going on is Cyclops and Jean Grey, so they're going to have a baby. Jean Grey's pregnant. Cyclops and Jean talk about leaving the team because of the baby. The love triangle between Wolverine, Cyclops, and Jean is still there despite Jean being married to Cyclops and having a kid. Wolverine still has that subtle resentment towards him. It's not like he hates him, but it's very subtle. So... Sunspot escapes, they go to a nightclub, and they have a great scene here where Morph is like mocking Jean Grey, and Wolverine's getting like irritated because of this whole pregnancy thing and how upset it is. Jubilee plays the role of Dazzler here, and so they find, the Friends of Humanity do show up, and they find some of their tech, and Rogue crushes it, but that's where they find Sunspot. Now, the big confrontation is, they're trying to find out how to... They're trying to get to Bolivar Trask. So Cyclops and Storm go confront Gyrick about Trask. Now, Gyrick's the guy who killed Xavier. And 
the X-Men have to deal with the fact that now Xavier's gone, Cyclops will assume leadership role. And it's kind of hard for them to talk to Gyrick considering what he's done. And he's also a dick in this episode too. So he's refusing to give it up. So what happens? They Cerebro his ass. So Jean Grey uses Cerebro to get the info. Seeing visions of Master Mold. And we find out that Bolivar Trask is making a new Master Mold. Very scary. And they decide they have to stop him. So all the X-Men go find him. And it's kind of funny, Wolverine wants to kill Bolivar Trask, but Cyclops is like, we can't really do that. So the Blackbird was destroyed by a Sentinel. And this is where they all land, and when Cyclops says, to me, my X-Men, from the trailer. So the Blackbird's destroyed, but all the X-Men make it because Rogue has those, you know, Rogue can fly and Storm can use her powers. So Trask is there with a new Master Mold. Total throwback of Season 1. Master Mold and Trask were the main villains of Season 1. And they're back, and they were trying to do the same thing over again. So the X-Men fight the Sentinels. This was the scene that was shown in that preview clip that came out a few, you know, last week or whatever. It was so amazing. And this show is so much better than I thought it was going to be. First, the X-Men are just destroying the sentinels then all of a sudden like omega level mutant detected storm uses her omega level powers to create like a giant storm like a tornado and completely shreds apart completely destroys the remaining sentinels master mole is the last one so gambit powers up wolverine's claws morph transforms into the blob yes the mutant the blob Wolverine jumps on his belly to bounce up and decapitates Master Mold. Just like that, it's over. The X-Men in this show completely destroyed the Sentinels with ease. It wasn't even a thing where it was like a challenge. This felt like it was easy. I mean easy. And Gambit powering up Wolverine's claws was so freaking awesome. That team up, the way they work together, beautiful. I can't tell you how much I love this, bro. It was so much better than I thought it was going to be. And the fighting was amazing. So, the episode ends where Gene and Scott are talking about leaving the team. But th there's an intruder at the X-Mansion. And Magneto shows up. And he says that he's the new leader because Charles Xavier's last will and testament said that everything's his. So, Magneto is the new leader of the X-Men. That's the cliffhanger. Now, episode two is... Basically has this plot thread of, is Magneto for real changing his mind? Has he changed his mind? Is he, is he more like Xavier? Or is it still the same old cunning Magneto that secretly wants to kill all humans and make mutants the dominant species? Well, that's what this episode's about, episode two. They open up with this Coney Island Ferris wheel disaster where the Ferris wheel breaks and Magneto saves the people. And that's already a thing. So while that's going on, the Friends of Humanity are attacking the Morlocks. So the Friends of Humanity are still the main like problem here, or at least the recurring problem of this show. So the X-Men... So Magneto ends up saving the Morlocks, and the X-Men are trying to figure out like why Xavier chose Magneto to be the leader. And Magneto says he's trying to unite humans and mutants together, which is very unlike him. Now Cyclops does not want to leave the team, but Gene tries to explain that it was the professor's choice to pick Magneto. So basically they don't trust Magneto. There's a really powerful scene here where Jean Grey talks to Storm, Storm about her pregnancy and the kid and how she's worried that if he's a mutant, they're going to have a hard life. Now, this is a throwback to X-Men, the original 92 series, because there was a line... Where Jean Grey was like, if we ever have children, what do we do? How can we raise kids in a world that hates mutants if we're both mutants? Now, obviously, if you know anything about the characters, you know that Cyclops and Jean Grey have a, have Cable, but they really don't. And we're gonna get more, we're gonna get to that later. I'm gonna explain that later because I cannot believe they're actually going through with this fucking storyline. I I can't believe it. 
I'll talk more about that in a minute. But anyways, the, the, the main story here, first of all, there's a scene with Magneto and Rogue. And obviously, again, if you know the comics, there are storylines where Magneto, Magneto and Rogue got together. I think the Age of Apocalypse might have been the first time they were actually like really together. So that scene was great. And Magneto, th that scene was good because like it showed the respect and love that Magneto had for Charles. So they tease that rogue Magneto, Magneto relationship. And what happens is this. So the UN shows up at the X mansion. And because of Magneto and all the bad stuff he did before, he has to go to trial with the UN. And he accepts being arrested knowing he may have a chance. So like what Beast did in the first season of X-Men 92, he's going to try and use the judicial system in a positive way and trust the people to free him. Because the whole story is that, you know, he made mistakes, but he's now, you know... Trying to go on the right side. And the whole story is that Magneto was only defending and protecting mutants from humans. So, this is a phenomenal scene. So, there's a scene where Magneto discusses, without actually saying it, he discusses being Jewish. He talked about how I was persecuted because I said that I called God by another name. And he's talking about being a Jew, because that's Magneto's backstory. They didn't quite say, you know, the whole thing with the Holocaust, how it affected him, but that's, it's there, and the fact that they went there puts a big smile on my face. Good Lord, they actually went there. He has this phenomenal monologue, and it's the first time he ever really went deep, as deeply into it as before, putting up a very good case. So the Friends of Humanity are there, and they're about to mess it all up, and they're with the Executioner. Executioner is another character that I never thought I'd see in the anime series, but I'm happy. So while that's going on, Jean and Logan are back at the mansion, and Jean goes into labor, and Logan has to take her to the hospital. God, I love this. I loved it. There were so many things happening. So Executioner wants Magneto dead. They have this awesome fight where they break into the trial. Everything goes haywire. The X-Men are trying to protect, like, you know, the humans and, and mutants. Cyclops fights the Executioner, and it was freaking awesome. What an awesome fight it was. Rogue, while that's going on, Rogue took Cyclops. Like, Cyclops hears a message from Jean Grey, like, in his mind. Rogue's taking Cyclops to go to Jean because she's in labor. The Doctor, being a racist slash mutant prejudice guy does not want to deliver the baby because they're mutants and he's worried the baby might destroy something. That part kind of makes sense because you never know. When they get angry, you know, it, but the mutation, what's dumb about that is the, it makes sense but not really, but the doctor probably didn't know any better. If you study X-Men, mutants don't get their powers usually until they go through puberty. That's the thing. Most mutants don't actually get their powers activated until puberty if they had the X gene. So it would not be a thing that doctor would have to worry about, but he doesn't know any better. So Executioner is about to blast Magneto with his gun. Storm takes the shot. She goes down. Magneto is angry and pissed that Storm is hurt. So they're teasing Magneto, killing everybody at the court. He's lifting him up into space, but he changed his mind because... Or he doesn't change his mind. He realized that Xavier's message was about mercy and he lets them live. That shows that Magneto is a changed man and he's also in the intro to the show and that was beautiful. My God. So Rogue ends up taking the doctor's, like she touches him to take his quote-unquote powers, aka learning how to deliver a baby. Jean delivers her baby. They named the kid Nathan Summers. That's Cable. Now, we're going to go we'll talk more about that in a minute. At the X Mansion, there's talk of Genosha joining up with the UN. Things are getting better. Beast then explains that the laser rifle that Storm got shot with had the same radiation, but it's concentrated, that the Collars have. So they basically took Storm's powers. Like, Storm is permanently, does not have her powers anymore. So as they tease Gene and Cyclops leaving the team, Storm leaves a letter to them. This was so emotional. Storm wrote a letter to them and they read it to the team. We're reading it and it's emotional as hell about her departing and trying to be a normal human. 
Then, as everything is all sad, there's a knock on the door, and guess who shows up? Gene. Another Gene Gray is at the door, and that's your cliffhanger. I am in love with this show already. It is so much fun. It is so powerful. It definitely keeps the spirit of the original. You do know what they're doing, right? In the comics, Cyclops married somebody who looked exactly like Jean Grey, but it wasn't Jean Grey. It was Madeline Pryor, a.k.a. the Goblin Queen, a clone of Jean Grey created by Mr. Sinister. I think... That's the story they're going with. He probably doesn't know that this gene is Madeline Pryor because I believe she has her memories erased or something like that. I forget. But the real gene has just shown up and the baby, because the Cable's supposed to be Goblin Queen's son, but he still calls Jean Grey his mother. If I remember correctly, it's been a while because she's the clone of her and it's the same genes. No pun intended. I cannot wait to see what they do with this. I, my God, they're actually going through with the freaking Goblin Queen storyline. I can't believe it. I cannot believe it. I am so hyped for X-Men 97. I don't know who, I don't know who had the audacity to say this was woke. This was not woke. People need to stop with the woke shit. They really got to stop. And I'm talking about on both sides. Oh, well, this is woke. That's woke. Enough. Not everything is woke. This was not woke. I loved it. And I cannot wait to watch more. I could care less about the MCU right now, even though I'm going to go see Dare Deadpool because it looks awesome. But this, X-Men is what got me into comics. X-Men 92. And now we've come full circle. I love it. I love this show. I can't wait to watch more. Take care.